Hey everybody, I'm Kerry Cranston. I'm coming to you live from the American Writers Museum. Uh, we have been closed since March 13th, uh, sad to say, uh, but like everybody else, we're trying to get by. Uh, so if you're new to the American Writers Museum, welcome. I'm gonna give a tour. I'm gonna kind of show everybody around, explain where the museum came from, what it's all about. Uh, the other thing we're gonna do today is um, take some questions on the uh, chat function of this YouTube thing. I have my iPad in hand and we'll check it from time to time, but I'm gonna get started and just kind of walk around and talk a little bit. Uh, we are online, so definitely check out our website, AmericanWritersMuseum.org. We have a lot of online activity going on now. We launched a new website um, for one of our special exhibits, My America. Uh, we've also been doing some live online author programs. Um, those have gone really well, so look on our website under events and you'll see all about that. Uh, that being said, let me kind of explain the museum to you. The American Writers Museum uh, opened in May of 2017. It was conceptualized by a, a gentleman named Malcolm O'Hagan. Uh, he's what we call our founder. Malcolm, if you're out there, hello. Uh, but Malcolm uh, very quickly recognized that there was no such thing as an American Writers Museum. He was in his retirement. He did not need to do this, but he thought it was important. And so he uh, immediately started leaning on friends. Um, Bernard Hine and uh, Jay Hammer were a couple of folks out in the DC area who helped Mal Malcolm move forward and um, really build the idea of a museum. One of the things they picked out pretty quickly was the idea that there's no such thing as a museum of this type that should be curated by one person or it would have one voice. So they enlisted a whole lot of people to try and help figure out what would be in the museum of this type, the content and the information. So. We had a content leadership team of uh, six people. We had subject matter experts of nearly 40 people, uh, writers, poets, editors, scholars, a whole host of folks who helped us decide what would be in this museum, what it would be about. Um, that being said, uh, it's a different type of museum. And so I'm gonna kind of explain what it's about and some, show you some of the exhibits. So I'm gonna start moving around and talking. Um, I'm going to start off, we are standing in what's called Writer's Hall, the entrance hall to our museum. Uh, you'll find that there are some fun touch screen exhibits. Um, in, our, in our new world, I'm going to use a stylus. Um, when we reopen, uh, which hopefully will be in a couple of months, um, we will start to use um, uh, styluses, we will have gloves for our visitors, um, and we'll do things a little bit differently than we've been doing them. Uh, along with a lot of uh, regular cleaning and social distancing practices. So uh, we're looking forward to getting open, um, but in the meantime, definitely check out our web page, subscribe to our YouTube. Uh, so this example of an exhibit piece that's interactive that lets people kind of dig down and find out about where authors come from, where they were born. Um, I can pick a state, I can go into, say, Illinois, and I can see a whole host of famous writers from Illinois, from Lorraine Hansberry to Ernest Hemingway. I can pick that author, um, find out a little bit more about them, find out about some of their most famous works. Now, part of the reason we have this here when people first walk in the door is we have, get a lot of visitors from around the country and even around the world. And it's fun for people to kind of look out and see, you know, is there someone from my state um, that's here in the exhibit pieces. Uh, the other reason we have this is over here on the wall, we have um, a map and bookmarks that highlight our affiliate network. Our affiliates are author homes around the US that um, celebrate and are small museums for a number of different writers. We have over 75 author home affiliates. Um, when this museum was first conceptualized as an idea, it was recognized pretty early on that um, these homes existed, uh, and while we were making the first museum dedicated to all of American writers, this is a fun way of exploring some of the very special um, places all over the country. So I've picked up one, for example, of Laura Ingalls Wilder um, up there in, Wisconsin, or in uh, Minnesota, number 49. And when I turn it over, I can find out all about um, the home and museum space up in Minnesota of hers that we can go visit. There are actually multiple Laura Ingalls Wilders uh, homes around the US uh, just because, as anyone who's read the books would know, they moved around a lot. Um, so that being said, I'm going to kind of move us away from this opening area and into our Nagani Foundation Children's Literature Gallery. Um, 
This is a space that is meant to really celebrate um, children's writings. It's a space where kids can come in and um, be very hands-on with the very tactile exhibits that are in here. Uh, they can sit down and read books, um, and people can read to their kids in here. And actually, on Saturdays, we have story time. Uh, so if people are here with their kids, we uh, come in and do readings with their children, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Now, we haven't been able to do that since we closed, so we started doing it online. Um, you can see it on Facebook Live um, on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. Uh, you can also then see the ones we've already posted here on our YouTube channel, um, picking up in the next week. So this weekend, um, it's kind of fun. We actually have a few different uh, folks who are going to be reading, but one of them is the artist Paul Zielinski. So uh, you're probably looking at this beautiful mural on the wall. And uh, this is an original piece. Uh, Paul lived here for two weeks uh, up on a scaffold, finishing this mural. and. Um, a lot of work went into this. He worked with uh, one of our curators, uh, Leonard Marcus, um, to pick the 32 classic American children's books that are in this uh, tree and the squirrels who are reading them. Um, what's fun about this, uh, Paul actually recreated the first edition book cover of each book and then made a subtle reference between each squirrel and the book that they're reading. So I'll give you an example. Down here in the corner, we've got The Wizard of Oz um, being read by a squirrel wearing glass slippers. Of course, in the book, they are glass slippers, not ruby. Um, so squirrels are, are our friends here. We, we sell them in our gift shop, but apparently while we've been gone, they have escaped. Um, there are a couple in here who are just checking out their friends in the mural. Uh, we may stumble upon a few more as we move through the museum. So again, check out our story time on Facebook Live um, on Saturdays and or check it out on our YouTube channel. So I'm gonna keep moving. I'm gonna take us over to what is called a nation of writers. And I'm gonna to have to remember, as they told me, to walk backwards. This is going to lead to me tripping and falling over at some point, I'm pretty sure. Uh, this hall is our densest uh, area of content. It really is a celebration of writers. Uh, there are over 200 writers featured in one way or another in this particular part of the space. And when we talk about writers, we talk about um, all types of writing. Now, there are two exhibits in here. The one on my right is called American Voices. It's kind of what people normally might expect from a writer's museum. It's a chronology. It's an, a listing of American history and major events in American history over 400 years. Um, the writers are in chronological order. And as they're really working through, you can dig down into information on individual writers um, in that particular era. You can see that then we learn how these writers are tied together um, about the Enlightenment or the Great Awakening. Um, and what's really fun about this is that you'll find writers that you know and writers that you don't. There's a huge amount of content along this wall. But we're always careful to say that these people are just emblematic and representative. There's no way to feature every great writer in American history in um, one museum space. So when we picked writers, they're meant to illustrate uh, periods and genres um, and styles of writing and important influences, um, but we're never ranking them. We never say one writer is better than another. Um, they're just representative and really good examples of the development of the idea of an American voice that is distinct. Um, on the opposite side uh, from this hundred writers is a different hundred writers in what we call our surprise bookshelf. Um, and this is a lot of fun because here we're exploring what it means to be a writer. Uh, again, sometimes people focus on the, the common idea of the short story or uh, poetry or novels, um, but of course there are all forms of writing. So there are food writers and dystopian fiction writers and comic strip writers and comedians and speech writers. Um, so we call it the surprise bookshelf because normally if I open it, there's gonna be some text in a picture to kind of give me an idea about that writer. Um, but sometimes they're gonna be different. Sometimes they're gonna give us some sound. And so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. <laughs> That's pretty good for right about now. Um, I'm being told that I should look at the Q&A and answer a question. This is going to, of course, require me to put on my glasses, which will also lead to me tripping. Um, somebody is watching from State College, Pennsylvania. 
Um, hope to visit when this madness is over. Uh, can you please let us know if there's a listing of the smaller writer museum by state somewhere? Yes, I'm sorry, I did not mention that. Our affiliate network of the 75 plus are listed on our website. So just head into our website. I believe it may be under, oh gosh, I've suddenly forgotten what section, but just go to the top navigation and you will find our author home affiliate listing. Um, also subscribe to our newsletter. We put out um, information about our affiliates on a regular basis and what they're doing at their facilities. Um, the uh, a couple other things you might find in this surprise bookshelf. You've got uh, dioramas. You've also occasionally got smells. So um, for this example, James Beard, the famous food writer. There's a wonderful quote from James Beard here. And there is a horrendous smell of garlic and onions. I have to say, I have missed that. Um, not having the museum open. That is actually the funnest thing to open when small children are around because then they put their nose right up to it and then they run away um, crying. So it's a lot of fun. Anyway, I'm gonna keep walking. Again, I'm gonna try and remember to walk backwards. Uh, I'm gonna move kind of quickly through here because I could spend all day talking about all of these writers. Um, I wanna point out something fun that, you know, people might not always catch. So for example, on my left, uh, we passed a box earlier and Maya Angelou was listed there. Uh, and so when I talk about writers that might be on this wall that people don't always know as well, I'll give an example of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, a writer who was incredibly influential and, and, and uh, successful in his day. Um, unfortunately died young, uh, but had a number of books published. Uh, what's really interesting about uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, if you don't know his poetry and some of his writing, is that this is where Maya Angelou took uh, the title of her most famous uh, book, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, is a line from one of his poems. So um, these are the types of connections that you find as you move through the museum and really dig through some of its content. Um, along those ways, uh, I want to also kind of explain these talking heads that are here. Uh, these are some of the folks who helped us put this museum together. Ivy Wilson, Maureen Corrigan, Alain Stevans. Um, they took some time to really look at three different themes that tie these hundred writers together that are illustrative of the idea of an American voice. Um, and if I pick one of these themes, like Ivy, Alain Stevans, and I pop on down, I'll find that he talks about the idea of identity in three ways. I can dig down and listen to his mini lecture on national identity. I do have the volume turned down. Um, but uh, Alan gives a really interesting lecture, but as he's talking, if I'm interested in uh, who he's talking about, I can dig down for more information. Now this is why I call this exhibit the master's degree. If you want to read all of the content in this exhibit, um, dig down, watch all of these videos and all of the sub information in each one of these videos, then we will give you a master's degree. Um, it's not worth anything and it's not accredited, but um, it's there for you if you want it. So this is our Nation of Writers Hall. Oh, I see one of the squirrels has escaped as well and is hanging out with Diane Fossey. Um, so, uh, but we'll show you one more thing here, which is of course our uh, word waterfall which is like the film that opens up at the front of this exhibit space, um, something that's a really nice exploration of what it means to be American. Um, the words are printed on the wall. The light is reflecting off of the words. The quotes are pulled out um, when they're lit up and the images are created uh, by really using the letters and the words as pixels. Um, it's a really beautiful piece. It's something that people like to sit and contemplate after reading a lot of material. And um, it's also something that people call an Instagram spot. Um, I don't really understand Instagram because I'm old, but I will say that uh, I have seen some really cool pictures of people standing in front of these words. Uh, but this is our Nation of Writers Hall. It's a big part of the museum, but it's only one part. I'm gonna move on and uh, talk a little bit about um, our new temporary exhibit. Uh, but by temporary, uh, this does uh, plan to run through May of 2021 at this point. Uh, we've also actually put a huge amount of content from this exhibit online at my-america.org. Uh, we just uh, launched that a couple of weeks ago. This exhibit in and of itself is a multimedia exhibit. Uh, we interviewed over 30 different writers. Um, 
and got their take on 10 different themes. Uh, similarly to the creation of this museum in this uh, exhibit, we worked with a team of six uh, writers themselves who are immigrants and or refugees who gave us guidance in picking the themes and writing the questions that we would ask the writers, helped us select different writers to ask uh, these questions of. So uh, this room is actually full of probably over uh, four and a half hours of video content. Um, all I have to do is pick a writer and explore the idea of why I write, uh, tap learn more, and the um, author answers the question and I can pick up this listening device and listen to them. Uh, it's, it's really fun to kind of sit here and see them close up and feel like you're making a connection. Uh, so there's, again, a lot of content in here. Um, there are uh, books from these writers that people can browse through and um, some maps and some timelines and other information. Again, a lot of this has been shared on our uh, website, uh, my-america.org. <coughs> We've also put the curriculum up for that. Our museum is one that is obviously very educationally focused and we do a lot of work uh, with school groups and we have a lot of field trips come in and so that's why we wanted to create something that students could use while we're closed. Uh, so that website is there and we actually plan to be launching some more information relatively soon. Uh, I am checking to see if there's another question I should answer and I'm going to skip the questions for now and keep moving on. Uh, so one of the things we do every time we do an exhibit is that we like to have a place for the visitors to write and uh, get engaged with the exhibit. So this piece right here uh, lets people grab a luggage tag and tell us their family's immigrant story or their own personal immigrant story. We've actually collected thousands of these already. Uh, they're really interesting, moving, fascinating pieces. Uh, and we're looking forward to having people come back in the museum and give us more. Again, on the website, you can share these stories with us as well. Um, as you can see, one of the squirrels has escaped here and has told us that uh, he came from a tree. Again, not very helpful, but we will get them back into the gift shop before we reopen. Uh, so that is our new special exhibit. We hope you'll visit it online. We hope you'll come back and visit it here in the museum when we reopen. I'm going to step into what is called our Reader's Hall. Uh, this is a space that has two purposes for us. Uh, it is first and foremost a place where people can come in, sit on a couch, grab a book off the shelf. Uh, they can also look at the pieces on the wall that explore the notions of how readers and writers connect. So we've moved on from listing writers and their works to really talking about the connection between readers and writers, from publishing houses to bookstores to libraries, what are those connecting points. Um, there is an interactive here that lets people vote for their favorite book and our favorite writer, and it catalogs and continues um, to change all the time, ranking uh, people's favorites uh, based on visitors who have been here. So if I say Mark Twain, I can grab one of Mark's books, drag it over, and if I fill up this space and hit submit, my votes are tallied, but it will also send me an email with uh, my JPEG of my bookmark that I've created. So it's just a fun place for people to interact. I said this space has two purposes. The other is we do a lot of programming here in the museum. Um, we have authors in on a regular basis. We have scholars in to talk about authors from the past. We do panel discussions. Uh, we do all of that normally in this space. Uh, the authors would normally stand up here in the front of the room, uh, and it's usually a lot of fun. We've started doing those online as well. So we've done two author talks recently. We have a number on the schedule. We're really looking forward to um, getting people back in here, but for the long term, uh, next probably five to six months, I expect that all of our author programs will be online. They've been pretty interesting and we have some good ones lined up, so definitely check those out on our website. Uh, so that's the other purpose of this room, is to have these great programs. And some of the past programs are also being put up on our YouTube channel now, and we expect to keep rolling out past programs. Uh, now I'm gonna move into what is called the Mind of a Writer Gallery. 
And the mind of a writer gallery uh, is where we really start to talk a little bit more about process. And the first thing of process that we have here is the story of the day. We have typewriters. They are all functional. Um, apparently a squirrel has jumped onto one of them. Uh, but this is where people can actually sit down and start to write their own story. So if they want to say, the dog barked, and hopefully this key won't stick on them, uh, they can start to write their story, um, whatever that might be. And what's fun about this space is that they can then um, post it on the wall, they can take it home with them, they might write a letter to their kids. Uh, when we have field trips again, the kids line up for a chance to touch a typewriter, to write on something like this, and to understand what writers of the past had to do to put their works out to the world. Of course, there are still some writers today who like to use these. Um, though one kid who was here, a fifth grader I believe, once said that uh, he called the typewriter an instant printer. So if you think about that, it is definitely um, a, uh, a very different type of machine. Uh, and, and it's really the only piece of technology that was ever designed specifically and only for the process of writing. Um, your computer does a lot of different things. You can do a lot of different things with a pen, but a typewriter is really just meant for writing. So this is a lot of fun. It definitely gets people feeling the idea of process, again, encouraging our visitors to write, which is one of the things we like to do. Um, this other room here, uh, which I will step into really quickly, is called the writer's room. And this is our other changing space. So like the Meyer Gallery, where we have our My America exhibit, um, this uh, Roberta Rubin's writer's room, uh, we have had multiple exhibits in here. Uh, this current exhibit is called Tools of the Trade. And it explores uh, some of the writing instruments that did belong to these actual writers. So that is Jack London's original typewriter. Um, that is one of the typewriters that Ernest Hemingway owned. Uh, this is Orson Welles typewriter, and if you look at it closely, you'll actually see that he signed it, Orson and Welles, on the two sides. So this exhibit uh, came about primarily because people were very nice in loaning these wonderful artifacts to us for this uh, special exhibit. Uh, Steve Soberoff out of Los Angeles uh, keeps a very large collection of uh, famous people's typewriters, and he loaned us a number of these. Uh, we also have pieces um, like uh, Helen Keller's Braille writer, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks's typewriter, and a few others that were loaned to us from other folks. And uh, we're very grateful for that. Uh, so this is a fun new exhibit. Uh, we're actually looking forward to the next exhibit in this space will be on the writer Ray Bradbury. We planned to open that uh, late this summer or early fall. We cannot guarantee that those will be the exact dates, but the next exhibit in that room will be Ray Bradbury as we all try to figure out what we're doing in post-COVID-19 times. So as I move away from that special exhibit space, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this hall, Mind of a Writer, where we really explore the idea of um, what the process is, take deeper dives into the works. So these uh, tables here are called the Featured uh, Works Tables. And they let people really dig into the content of particular works. And what's fun is, again, like everything here, it's meant to be engaging. I can grab an icon and I can pull it down and it will open a small website's worth of information on that one particular work. Um, and I can dig down and find out about the author. I can look at the major themes involved. I can even hear an excerpt read out loud which sometimes may actually be from the actual writer themselves. So similar to the Nation of Writers Hall, this is a lot of content in a very interactive way. Um, when we have our field trips, this is one of the places where you find the students really digging in, um, learning and engaging. Uh, it is a great way to explore the process of writing and the work that these writers do and how they influence our, our history and our culture. Uh, some of the other things in here are fun. They look at things like building a routine, um, looking at the notion of um, you know, what do writers do, uh, what gets them going. So I can look at who likes to have cigarettes and scotch while they write. And of course I will find out that that is Chester Himes um, versus who kept dairy goats. And that would be the poet Carl Sandburg. So 
it's fun, it's a way to explore, it's also a way to think about what are the things that people do that really get them excited. Um, and uh, we like to challenge our folks. Um, along the walls over here we have um, first lines of famous works. Uh, we have, I lost an arm on my last trip home. And I challenge people whenever I'm walking by this area, if they can guess all of them, I'll give them $100. There's always some easy ones, there's always some tricky ones. So that's Octavia Butler's Kindred. Uh, Ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. Of course, is Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. Um, so the opening line is just one of those things that really gets people going, gets them to dive into a book. And we really like to explore that idea of opening lines. Um, I'll show you some other fun stuff that people like to play with here. Uh, again, the idea of word selection, what words do writers choose, um, the idea of taking action, using the right verbs, using the right adverbs. Um, so Elmer Gantry, he was eloquently drunk, lovingly and pugnaciously drunk. So. The right word choice really has an impact on the piece. And so this is just, again, one of those fun ways for people to engage. We also have places for people to play with words. The word play area of our museum lets people do word games. Uh, the word play tables right there let you actually do kind of a fun Mad Lib of famous pieces of writing. So if I grab one, I can see that I can pick a novel and I will be given a whole host of words to try and fill out and get points. So Atticus said to Jem, one blank, uh, one zin. I don't think that's correct, uh, but I would get some points for it. But anyway, it's a fun game. You can actually play a two-player mode. I've seen whole contests go on amongst students on field trips. It's really a lot of fun. Uh, the story canvas over here lets you select from words that are randomly generated and make your own poetry. Uh, apparently the squirrels here have made a new poem. Uh, her mysterious dog meowed as the dangerous rabbit evaporated. I don't know what the squirrels have been eating or drinking while they've been alone in the museum, um, but that's what they chose to write today. Uh, so as we've worked our way around um, through nation of writers, through the mind of a writer, through our reader's hall. Um, I'm stepping into an area that is our Chicago gallery. And this is the Chicago gallery because the museum is here in Chicago. Now people sometimes ask why is the museum in Chicago if it is a national museum? And the reason is that our founders went around the country. They really thought about where should a writer's museum be? Uh, and they looked in New York and they looked at San Francisco and they looked at a number of cities and they really felt like Chicago was a great place for this museum to be because it's in the center of the country. It has its own rich literary tradition and um, the city was uh, very excited about it as were a number of people who really helped to make it happen here uh, to really support it and get behind it. So that's what brought the museum here to Chicago even though most of our founders were in Washington DC. And we're very lucky for that, for those of us here in the city. Um, we get visitors, as I said, from all 50 states and from around the world. It is uh, an engaging space. I will tell you a, a little bit of background. Our design firm is out of Boston. Uh, the design firm spent a lot of time making this place visual and engaging and fun. Uh, and when I came on board in 2016 and I saw the design of this room, I said, that these hanging bookmarks, which is what he called them, are really a great idea because they're very evocative of the stockyards of Chicago and how much that's tied to its literary history. Uh, to which the designer was aghast because at no point had he thought about stockyards or hanging pieces of meat in designing his beautiful museum. Um, but I still tell people that that's what this room is for, even if that was not his intention. Uh, but there's a lot of fun here, a lot of people to explore. Um, the, uh, whether it's Ida B. Wells, Frank Baum, uh, who wrote uh, all of the Wizard of Oz books. And he wrote the first books here in Chicago. 
He actually had all of the books were published here even after he moved away from Chicago. So again, it's a really fun place to explore and to dig through. So the museum itself physically is not huge. Um, people come here and visit and sometimes spend hours and hours and hours. Uh, some people come through and spend a little bit of time finding their favorite writers, finding a few new writers, um, and taking the time to actually sit down and write themselves. And that's what we like to do here. So I'm gonna take a quick look and see if anybody has a question for me. Um, do you have employees who are still working from home doing research? All of our employees are still at home doing research. All of our employees are writing blog posts. They are putting together content. They all helped us launch the My-America website. Um, so everybody is still working. Uh, one of the great things about our museum is that we are actually a very lean organization and we have a wonderful staff um, who have stepped up in a very difficult time and a lot of people are doing things they don't normally do um, but everybody is still working and they're still doing a phenomenal job so thank you for asking that question um, and uh, I'm seeing if there are any other questions that I should uh, hello from Budapest Hungary okay my fifth grade son wants to know how long would it take to go through the museum thoroughly uh, as I mentioned, um, I have been here on a day when I uh, uh, saw a young woman uh, and I kept seeing her in the same place throughout the day and I talked to her at the end of the day and she was here about five hours um, and she still had not seen everything. Uh, we encourage people to become members if they're going to be in town because, uh, and, and live in the area or if they come to Chicago regularly. Uh, members can come anytime and there's just too much content to get it all done in a day. Uh, but a lot of people come for a couple hours and have a really good time, so I do hope your fifth grade son will come and visit from Hungary. Uh, that would be phenomenal. Uh, oops, somebody said they're a huge Ray Bradbury fan. We're glad to hear that. Do I have virtual jobs even not during the pandemic? Uh, no, right now we do not have any virtual employees. Um, uh, all of our employees who worked for us have become virtual employees, um, but I do hope that in the future, if we grow, uh, that may be something that happens. Uh, and um, I'm just double checking if there's anything else that looks like a question. I think we have hit the half hour mark, which is what we said we would do, a quick half hour tour. I hope it's been somewhat informative. Um, I hope for those of you who've never been to the American Writers Museum, this is something that you might wanna do to come and visit us. Um, definitely, like I said, check out our YouTube page, um, check out our website, check out the new my-america.org and write. I encourage everybody to write constantly. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram. And, um, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel as in this time of being closed, we are going to continue to update new content um, on a daily and weekly basis. So we'll be here for you and we'll be here for you when we reopen. Thanks everybody. I hope this was fun. I hope it was worthwhile. And, uh, and thanks for letting me be part of your day.